Good morning and welcome to the Morning Spotlight Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Cam, coming to you as always from the Spotlight Studios here in Morristown, New Jersey. My guest today is a commercial real estate realtor, investor, and investment manager. And in just three and a half years, she's transacted over $300 million of commercial real estate, raised about $40 million in private equity, and began heavily investing in commercial real estate, amassing a large portfolio of, oh, I messed this up, a large portfolio of the industrial office, retail, and multifamily assets. Should have proofread that before I actually got started. She considers herself a serial networker and has a knack at connecting buyers, sellers, and investors together with her husband. She also runs a nonprofit assisting underprivileged individuals with their needs. She is Esther Rezis Lowenbein. Thanks did for I having me. Right? Did, I, did I say that right? I meant to ask you if I, like how to say your name. I was going to have you say it for me. And then I realized I got to the very end and was like, oh my God, I forgot to ask Esther how she actually said her name. Did I do it? Did I do it justice? Just about. Esther Just about. rises. 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 As in she rises to the rises. top. <laughs> what I, yeah. So I was close. I was close. <laughs> very, very close. I apologize. Very good. That's, that's great unprofessional job. of me. And Powers. I promise it'll just get better as we go along. Um, but, uh, but yeah, welcome. I, I mean, I've seen you all over LinkedIn. Um, as someone who likes to think that they're also all over LinkedIn, I see your stuff. And then I'm like, man, I have a lot of work to do. So um, talk to me about like, well, let's talk about LinkedIn. You know, like, tell me, tell me all the things like, like, why did you feel like that was a platform that you thought that you could put a lot of time and effort in to help grow your business, which is real estate? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. The reason I joined LinkedIn originally was just, you know, to make connections and to get my name out there. Um, but what I realized was that, first of all, the more you put out and you show yourself and, you know, you show who you are, people automatically, um, you know, want to connect with you based on who you are. That's why I like to share stories and share different things about myself, because I feel like it's more than just um, connecting on a, pro on a professional level. People also want to see who you are. But the reason I like LinkedIn a lot is Everyone on the platform has a similar mindset. We're all out there to grow. We're all out there to learn. We're all, we're all out there to connect. And you have people generally posting like positive things and just wanting to move to the next step. So I feel like it's a, it's a growth environment. Oh, it definitely is. You know, you know what I also found? So I sell title insurance for a living and I'm four years into this job. When I first started, I was doing, I tried cold calling, which I had no background in cold calling. Nobody taught me how to cold call. So my cold calls were disasters, like absolute disasters. And then I got on LinkedIn and started putting stuff out there and then connecting with people, sending messages, different things like that. And then I realized, oh, I could use this as like my cold call platform. And then you could actually, it has like a face to it, literally, you yeah, know, my exactly. face for, for better or worse. Um, but uh, but I, then I, that was how I started doing my cold call. So I think LinkedIn is tremendous. And like I said, I mean, I see you all over the place. So anybody listening to this episode, you go check Esther out on LinkedIn because she does put a lot of great stuff on there. So um, it's interesting because I don't go, I don't go into it with the mindset of, okay, I'm going to get out there and yeah. get myself out there. I naturally love connecting with people. Right. And I love just sharing. I'm a sharer by nature. Yeah. So I don't even feel like I'm actively trying to create this LinkedIn, um, you know, kingdom or whatever people think I am doing. It's just natural for me. Right. And, um, but it's interesting how now I get recognized as being a LinkedIn activist or something. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, you know what I think it is? And I think that, you know, like we talked about um, how I was listening to you on Yona, uh, Yona Weiss's podcast earlier uh, today to make sure I was prepared for this particular episode and other people like that. And I think a lot of us that have spent a lot of time and effort on LinkedIn, wh whether conscious or not, I think that obviously last year was a time where people just they had a lot more time to be on platforms like that. And then they started recognizing the people that were actually trying to put um, good stuff out there and connect with people. And that was just a, a great way for people to uh, establish those connections, make new connections, you know, reinforce old connections, different things like that. Um, and I think that there's a lot of value there because even though it's not, you know, um, me talking to you, like we're talking right now, we could talk right now and then you could pop on LinkedIn and see my stuff or see your stuff. You know, and it kind of keeps that that uh, that top of mind type thing going. So I think it's tremendous. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. So was real estate, have you always been in real estate? Did you do something before you got into real estate? Talk to me about the career path and how you wound up here. Straight from high school, I pursued a degree in speech language pathology. Um, I was inspired by a speech language pathologist that was working with my brother. And um, straight out of high school, 
I went to college and obtained my bachelor's and master's degree and worked as a speech therapist until about three and a half years ago, where I, when I decided to switch and um, pivot and move to the real estate world. Initially, I began as a residential realtor, and then I moved to the commercial space, uh, which is so much better for me, um, for also various other reasons. I uh, moved to the commercial space uh, about a year and a half ago. One of my clients had asked me to help them raise capital for their deal, help them find a JV partner. That quickly turned me into the raising capital space. Um, I got into that because of that. I've since raised over $40 million from JVs and GPs. And now I'm starting to raise from LPs. I'm starting a private equity fund. I syndicate. And in the last little bit, I started aggressively acquiring properties as well. So I'm a realtor, I'm an investor, and a, and a fund manager slash capital raiser. Right. Just covering all the bases in the commercial real estate world. Um, was there a reason why you decided to switch from uh, the speech language um, uh, pathology? Is that what you said? Yeah. Right. To the commercial real, uh, to, to residential real estate at first. Was, was there a reason why you decided to make that pivot? Yeah, there are several reasons. Um, number one, we were living in Brooklyn, New York, and we moved to Rockland County, New York. And the system of speech therapy over there was very different than here. It was it was much more difficult to set up schedule and you know find cases in a in a small um, space, meaning I'd have to travel a lot from location to location, and that's not something I was up for doing. Um, also, I have several children, and I was working with children. They coming home to my children. It became um, difficult to work with kids and then come home to kids and see kids all day. <laughs> a lot of kids. So, yeah. So I, I, you know, I just wanted that more like professional. I wanted to talk to an adult at some point in my day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was uh, one major reason. And another reason was the biggest reason most likely was that I wasn't feeling fulfilled. And I felt like I just didn't know anything. Like uh, my husband and I had this running joke. You probably heard me say this before that we were in a workshop. He would work and I would shop. Uh, that was my, you know, swiping the credit card was the extent of my financial knowledge. Right. And at one point I'm like, okay, I just need to know something. Yeah. Like what better way to start learning than to get involved in real estate? So I started, um, you know, researching everything. I, I literally didn't know anything so much so that when we bought our first home about, what was it? About four and a half years ago, I didn't even know what a mortgage was at the time. My husband took care of the whole process. I was clueless. And then one day I'm like, okay, I just, I just need to start learning. I just need yeah. to start knowing, um, you know, I, you know, for myself, I just wanted to see what's out there and you know, learn more. So I naturally um, got involved in real estate and the rest is history. Right. Yeah, exactly. Now you're just crushing it. Um, uh -huh. So talk to me about, uh, so I do want to get back to how you learned like the stuff that you did to, to educate yourself on the real estate world, because obviously going from zero to where you are now is quite the jump in just four and a half years. I mean, I've been selling title insurance for four years, and I feel like I've made quite a quite a jump in that four year span, maybe not from zero, but maybe from one. But um, talk to me about you mentioned in your earlier answer when I asked about how you got involved in real estate, that you said you started in residential real estate and eventually moved to commercial real estate. And that was better for you for a variety of reasons. Why do you think that that was just a better move um, commercial over residential? Well, the truth is when I got involved, I always wanted to go into the commercial space directly. But when I um, approached the broker of the brokerage that I joined, she was like, no, you need to start on the residential end. So I was like, that doesn't really make sense. They're two totally different animals. Right. But I, but I said, I don't mind learning that part too. So I started on the residential end, which has its beautiful benefits to it. You get to meet clients, you get to see beautiful homes and, you know, some not so beautiful homes and uh, go around, see the neighborhood, see designs, see ideas, connect with them on a more personal level. But commercial real estate, it's, um, first of all, it's all about who you know and, you know, who has what item to sell, sort of. And uh, it's more it's more practical. Like, does a person like the numbers? Do they like the location? Do they, do they like the deal? It's, it's more of a yes or no versus um, residential. You know, you have to be like a marriage counselor and a psychologist and and you just have to have like a ton of patience. And um, there was one client, one residential client that I showed 50 homes to. So oh my like, God. No kidding. Like, yeah, literally like 50 homes. 
Um, so, you know, that's it. And those are more on the weekends. So I wanted to switch to a more professional environment where things were more yes or no, like more right. practical. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Did they actually buy one after seeing 50 homes? I would hope so. Could you imagine yes. if you showed 50 homes and they didn't buy one? They're like, hey, you know what? We're good. Like yeah, I would fine. literally lose my mind. That, that would definitely. Um, uh, yeah. But that uh, one did. yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's good. Congratulations. So um, talk to me about the types of things that you did to educate yourself, because just to give you a background on the audience of the show, the spotlighters, which is what I call the audience, uh, the spotlighters generally are between the ages of 25 and 35. Um, so that they're either people that are in maybe corporate nine to fives and are interested in investing in real estate on the side. That's what they're starting to do right now. Maybe they're young real estate investors. There's maybe entrepreneurs in some different types of fields, but generally they're young professionals trying to do some different things. So talk to me about how, because you obviously said you just wanted to know when you said you were researching a lot, what were you, what types of things were you seeking out to educate yourself in the real estate world? Yeah. So I started by literally just reading whatever I got my hands on, um, reading articles, listening to podcasts, reading uh, newsletters, speaking to people, talking to attorneys, going to conferences, going to classes, webinars. Like I, between dealing with actual clients, I'm still learning. So I'm always doing something. If I'm not taking care of my kids, I'm either listening to a podcast or, you know, reading something or working. There's always, there's so much to know in this space. And now people come to me for advice. I, you know, I, they're like, wow, I see you're so successful. You're doing great. Um, can you give me advice on how to go about it? Like, what should I go into? Which podcast should I listen to? Which book should I read? Um, should definitely this morning podcast. spotlight, obviously, right? Oh, yeah. for sure, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Plug, plug. Plug, plug. Yeah, um, we love plugs yeah. here. We, we're all about shameless plugs. So sorry, sorry to cut you off. No worries. Um, so I always say like surface search, like uh, start searching all topics, see which one you feel most for, like see which one you appreciate more, you like more, and then dive further into that one. So, um, you know, initially I was just listening to everything. Then I got involved in, in starting my fund. So I was listening at that point to everything funds, every single podcast about funds. Um, so that was my niche at the time. So if I was, if let's say someone else wanted to start a fund, I'd recommend listening to podcasts about a fund. But in order to make a decision about what you want to go into, you have to like kind of like get your feet wet and everything. So just um, your podcast is great. Yona, Yona's podcast is great. There's so much value over there. Um, so many amazing speakers and you get to hear from all different types of people and different types of fields. Um, and that can help you decide further where to go. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and those are two great recommendations. So I appreciate that plug again. Um, but yeah, but um, so so uh, the other thing that you mentioned too, which I one hundred percent agree with, is that especially in the commercial real estate world, it's all about who you know, or and almost even more so, who knows you, right? So like you can know a lot of people, but if they don't know who you are, then it's irrelevant. But um, especially in someone like in my world, in the title insurance world, because it's all regulated here in New Jersey, also New York, Pennsylvania, also the same thing. It's literally relationships and service are the number one name. It's the name of the game. Like that is all this industry is based on. Um, so talk to me about like, was networking something that you naturally just kind of took to when you started with uh, in the commercial real estate world? Or was that something that you had to kind of, you know, cut your teeth, so to speak, in early on? Oh, uh, yeah. So I forgot to mention another reason that I joined the commercial real estate world was because I love meeting people. I love connecting with people. And so it's a natural thing for me. I'm a ma major extrovert. Um, and I love getting out there and connecting with people. So I was like, what better field to go into that I don't have to go back to college and learn a whole new you know, degree or start a whole new career than commercial real estate. Right. That was another reason that pulled me to it. And yes, definitely. One's network is their net worth. So it's important to have, a, a, you know, a valuable network out there. Oh, absolutely. So talk to me about maybe some of the ways that you started to build that network early on, right? So like I started, like I had mentioned on LinkedIn, that was just the only thing that I really had in front of me. I had no background in real estate whatsoever. 
like nothing. I was a college baseball coach before I started this job. So I just went on there and I was like, I'm just going to connect with anybody that has anything that has to do with real estate. I don't even know if they could actually send me business because I was still very new to the industry at the time and had no idea what I was doing. And then we're just going to figure it out. Was that a similar approach that you took or were you a little bit more strategic than maybe someone like me? Um, no, I think I was similar to you at that time. I had no um, intention going in. Um, yeah, I, at the beginning, I was just connecting to everyone in real estate, like you said. Now I'm very selective about who I connect with and I even go back and remove connections that, that don't make sense. So I think there's also a max of amounts of people that you can connect with. Yeah. So I want to make sure that I have valuable connections within my um, database. Oh yeah, hundred percent. And and then also talk to me a little bit about um, maybe the importance. So like, how, how do you approach it? Cause I think that that's one of the things that I get asked a lot by the community is just because like I have, I would think a, a sizable network and I've done some cool things with it, like in-person events and that, my, that are my own virtual events, obviously over 2020, obviously this podcast has been a way for me to expand that, that, uh, that platform and that network. But talk to me about maybe like how you approach the people in that network. So I think a lot of times, maybe young professionals, people new to networking, they don't quite understand like what to bring to the party. It's so to speak. Right. So like they come in and they're looking like, what can I get from you as opposed to like, how could I provide you with some type of value that makes you want to do business with me? You know what I mean? Because I think that that honestly is the most important part. Agree. Yeah, definitely. I feel yeah. like when people see that you're, you're transparent, honest, um, I think they gravitate more towards you. Um, that's one thing. And um, yeah, just being out there and it takes work. Like um, also like respond to other people's thing. Don't just sit there and, and uh, watch on the sideline, send some likes, you know, throw in some likes, throw in some comments, like give back kind of. Also, I started um, without any intention. I started writing articles I was writing for a magazine. I don't this at the moment and I'll, I can tell you why soon, but I was writing articles and I was featuring other people. So I was happily featuring other people's success and um, telling the audience like what we can learn from them, like learning from the best. So I, I felt like um, maybe giving to the community kind of helped me in return. Obviously I didn't do it with at the time with any motive of, getting anything back but when you offer things and you offer advice and you offer classes or meetups or network you know, networking uh, opportunities then it in turn benefits you yeah definitely give, give, give without expecting a return exactly because eventually you know like you give without expecting anything in return but eventually i feel like it comes back around at some point you know, whether you're able to connect somebody that makes a deal happen. And, you know, in my case, maybe I get some title work on the back end. That would be cool. Doesn't always happen that way, but it is what it is. You know, there's just like so many different ways that it can happen. And it might be a year from now, two years from now, whatever it is, but the more time and effort that you put into cultivating that network and that trust, like you said, that's really when you start to see the most results and the most success. Yes, absolutely. So talk to me. So now you're in the commercial real estate world. You're, you're in the process of building up this network and, you know, growing your, I guess, personal brand for lack of a better uh, phrase. Um, so talk to me about maybe like, when did you start uh, first start to see success in the commercial real estate world and think to yourself, oh boy, like we actually could be doing something pretty cool here. It's so funny because um, I love what I'm doing. So I don't define it as, okay, I, reached this milestone and now wow I'm successful yeah um I just flowing with it like so much of it seems so glamorous from the outside but it's really like so difficult and a lot of things don't work out and people don't always see that and they only see like wow you've reached that level of success for me it's like I'm trying as much as possible to enjoy the process um I don't necessarily know where the success line draws you know where where to place it but um, I, I'm, I love connecting people. So for me, that's, you know, that's, I feel, I feel like that's success right. because I get to help people. I get to help people invest their money in, in a good place. And I get to help sponsors, you know, um, find funds for their deal or help, you know, or find people deals as a realtor. So I just, you know, have enjoyment in this job and you know, it's fulfilling for me. Yeah. 
so do you think that maybe because you're doing so many things in the commercial real estate world, like you said, you're an investor, you're a realtor, you're a investment manager, you have this private equity fund that you're, that you're putting together. Um, you know, do you think that like, because I feel like sometimes I talk to people that are in the commercial real estate world and they're very focused on one particular thing. Do you think that just maybe by your nature, you're trying to do like a lot of things because you are so connected and know the industry so well at this point that you're able to kind of do diff- like wear different hats and still provide a lot of value to a lot of people? Oh uh, yeah. So there's a good thing and a bad thing about that. A uh, bad thing or not such so good thing is that I take on too much of myself. That's uh, um, that's me. I always like pile on things. Um, but, you know, people are like, why do you do so much? Why don't you choose one thing? I'm like, which one do I choose? I like them all. Yeah. Like, why not all? It's all a matter of making connections. Like, so if I'm connecting people with money or people with properties, I find it like I'm a matchmaker. So if, whether it's people or money or, or, you know, partners, what's the difference? Yeah. I'm doing my job. Right. That's how I see it. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I was just curious because I, I mean, I do know, like I said, I mean, I know people, a lot of people in the commercial real estate world, and they're sometimes very specific. Others are more broad like you. They do like a few different things and that, but it, because they're all kind of interconnected, they can help in a lot of different ways. And I think that maybe doing more things almost makes you more attractive to other people that want to do business with you because then they can, they know that you could handle multiple parts of maybe a deal from start to finish, you know? So there's a lot of different pros and cons to, to everything. But I was just curious because I know that you, you are doing a lot of stuff and just like you said, four and a half years, right? That's how long you've been in the commercial real estate game. Less, less, less. Yeah. yeah. So less and doing all these things. So I think it's just like, it's just a testament, I think to the education side of it and the networking side of it that has, you know, gotten you to this point for sure. Yeah. I do work a lot I yeah. work around, around the clock in between my kids. <laughs> um, but also like there, let's say like right now, I find like deal flow to be a little um, slower than what it was when I got started. So now I, I, I'm focusing a lot on the equity side. Um, you know, so each one has their, it's like a balance, you know, it's like a balancing scale Yeah. and trying to balance and do my best. Right. Yeah. So talk to me about maybe like how you're seeing different aspects of, like you just said, I mean, deal flows a little bit lower so or slower. So you're looking more at the equity side. And I think that, like you said, I mean, that kind of gives you some flexibility to kind of make sure that you're in the right position at the right time and all that kind of stuff. Um, but talk to me, I mean, obviously over the last year and a half, a lot of things with the different, you know, uh, all, all real estate markets, not just commercial, not just residential and all the aspects of commercial have, you know, been impacted to a certain degree by, you know, COVID and 2020 and everything. So how has that affected your business? I know you said deal flow right now is a little bit slower, but how is that kind of navigating that over the last year and a half? Um, yeah, year and a half about at this point. Um, how has that been for someone like you? So for me, COVID has been like, um, obviously it's been very sad with all the tra- tragedies and the lockdowns and all that. But for me, it's been a silver lining. Um, I Everything went on Zoom. I was able to do so much more in a shorter amount of time than before. You know, usually I'd go into Manhattan and meet with people. It would take up the entire day, just traveling, meeting here with COVID. I was having like 10 meetings a day. So that like started speeding up my entire business like really fast. So I had crazy growth in the last year and a half. Um, And that's when I started getting into equity as well. So um, for me, it's been, it's been, you know, a blessing in disguise and I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful for my journey and where it's led me to. Yeah. hundred percent. And I would, I would agree with that. I've met more people, excuse me, last year than I think I had met maybe in the first three years or two, whatever it was, two or three years doing this job prior to 2020. Just like you said, I mean, I work from home anyway. So going into the office was never really a thing that I had to deal with. But I would go to meetings, I would take people out for lunch, I would go to events, I would go networking events, different things like that, you know, do a lot of schmoozing, and a lot of networking. And then obviously, when you couldn't do that anymore, it all went just like this, like what we're doing right now virtual. So then I had to figure it out, you know, and I think that that um, people that 
seized that opportunity and saw what 2020 presented to them. And that silver lining was important because then it gave us a chance to, you know, maybe change a little bit how we do business, but also from just the networking side, that was a great way to just keep the network growing faster and faster, you know, than I had ever seen before. And now that I'm taking those same people and meeting them in person, it's like, we're old friends because we've been on a hundred Zoom calls together in the last year. So now like, we feel like we know each other and it just, you know, it makes everything that much easier. Right. Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, I still love the in-person events and I'm the first one to, to go to any, yeah. there's nothing, there's nothing like it, like meeting someone in person, especially like, um, I've gone to an event that I met a lot of, like you said, a lot of people that I, you joined, um, zoom calls with online or conferences, and then you get to meet them in person. You're like, oh, okay, right. you know, the person actually exists. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Do you ever get like thrown off by maybe like they're like a lot oh, taller yeah. or shorter or fatter oh, or yes. skinnier or whatever yes. than you thought all the time? I'm always like, yeah, Esther, you know, like something like that. <laughs> like I would have no idea, but yeah, you've it only was ever very seen, funny. Yeah, here up. Yeah, I was dealing with um, a seller in a particular property for about two months, and then I went to an event out of town, um, and suddenly I hear someone call my name. I had never seen this guy. But he's probably seen what I look like because I have my profile picture up uh, and he recognized me and he comes over to me and I'm like, who are you? <laughs> and and the, it's the seller that I was working with uh, for the longest time. And then I, I'm like, I had when I saw him, I had to like rethink the entire conversation. Yeah. Like you envision a person looking a certain way based on their voice and yeah. based on how they, they act. And then <laughs> when I saw him, I'm like, okay, I have to like rethink this entire thing. <laughs> Yeah, hundred uh, percent. That's happened plenty of times to me too. Yeah, it was really funny. Yeah, 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 yeah. But um, awesome. So let's talk a little bit more about maybe these young professionals that are trying to get started in the real estate world. Somebody that's done it. Somebody that found like their path, right? And maybe it was through education or whatever it is. But maybe talk to me about like what are some good ways to get started in real estate if you're interested in doing it. Is it education is it networking is it all of it is it something else um talk to me a little bit about that definitely all of it you have to do it all you have to go out there and join um your local you know that's how i started so join my local um h car or whatever it is you know hudson valley gateway that's where i am and then eventually they have events so you join those events you meet more people you expand your network um you have to learn you have to know a lot so join as many classes as possible um, you know, listen to podcasts when you're driving, cut out some movie time and, you know, actually sit and learn. There's a lot of work that needs to be put into it. It's not like a snap of the finger. Right. And everything just uploads into your brain <laughs> and into your, you know, your contact list. It's, there's a lot of effort that has to be done and yeah. um, you have to really enjoy it. So I also tell people, like, if you're going into this field, you really need to enjoy it because there are so many letdowns. There's so many of, I could talk about this for like hours, like stories that I've had, like working on deals for months that don't go through, or even as a buyer deals that we were in contract and we had to go out of contract or things that were in contract for, for the longest time and still didn't close. Like there's so many letdowns. And so I always tell people, like, if you go into this, you have to be willing to put in those hours. And, you know, sometimes you get nothing for it. Like, you know, that I told you, I went to show 50 homes. I got, I didn't get paid for those 50 homes that I showed the guy. Yeah. I got paid for the one he bought, but I didn't get paid for that time. So there's like that sacrifice of time that you have to put in and you have to be able to afford that use of time before going into the field and you really have to enjoy it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, dealing with no and um, definitely like, I mean, I sometimes, cause I get a little overexcited. If I get a deal in the door, because I had a couple in particular at the beginning of the year that I'm like, these are going to be huge. I just kicked my garbage can over accidentally. Um, these are going to be huge difference makers for me this year. Now I'm still having a great year. I'm still very happy with where I'm at, but these would have really just like accelerated that. And I'm like, Oh, I'm so excited. You know, like these are going to be great. Both of them canceled. And like, they were the multi-million dollar deals. And I was just like, damn it. You know, yeah. but that's, yeah. that's just the nature of the business, whether you're on my side, whether you're on your side, whether you're on any part of the real estate industry side, you just have to know that that's, that's possible. Right. Yeah. Exactly. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, also uh, one of the other things that I like to ask um, people that are in like the real estate investment world is the idea that, you know, you could take somebody that's maybe, let's just say my, I said before, my demographic of my show are people between the ages of 25 and 35. And then sometimes you get people that are maybe syndicators or investors or whatever. And they're like, okay, well, and to invest with me, you need $50,000, you need $25,000, whatever it is. Um, there aren't, uh, I mean, maybe I'm wrong because I was not like that at 25 years old, but there's not a lot of people that have that type of cash just sitting around, just ready to go into real estate investing because they're young. I mean, they're probably dumb, you know, like taking a paycheck and just spending it right away. Maybe they have an entry level job, whatever it is. So are there ways to get involved and get yourself, maybe your foot in the door with some of these deals without actually having that kind of coin right out of the gate? Um, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, there are these crowdfunding platforms that you could put in small amounts of money and that can eventually grow, but most syndications will require either 50,000 or 100,000 minimum. So it is, it is tough to get that first, first step in. Um, what else can be done? Either you can uh, go search for deals and you know, get an acquisition fee or, um, or put in that sweat equity, become a manager. So there's things, there's ways you can grow in the business besides for actually putting money. And people make a ton of money in real estate without putting down a dollar. If you find the deal, and you syndicate it and you raise the money. Um, I mean, a lot of people like when the sponsor has skin in the game, but there are people that have made a ton of money without putting down a dollar. Um, so this, there is, it's possible. Yeah, it's definitely possible. And I think that that's what happens to some people that like they get maybe turned off um, because they listen to some like people talk like, you know, and they hear that number and they're like, well, I'll never, like I, the whole point of me wanting to invest in real estate is that I can make money, maybe passive income, maybe whatever it is. But in order to get there, I need to have this much money on hand. Like it just, it's like, it seems like the, the logic is almost backwards, but like you're saying, there's different ways to go about it. And you're able to kind of get yourself, get your foot in the door or do some different ways to at least get the conversation started and maybe provide some type of value. And that's what really like what we're talking about is providing value, whether you're networking or in, you know, working with deals or doing uh, stuff with, you know, partners or in, uh, syndicating or whatever it is, you need to be able to provide some type of value, whether that's dollars or whether that's something else. Um, so it's definitely true. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, go intern with someone, you know, put that, those hours in, right. You're not going to get paid for a while, but you'll, yeah. you'll learn and you'll make connections. You never right. know where, where it will lead you, you to. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's a great point. So um, talk to me. I'm always interested to kind of see like what, kind of goals people have. So, you know, what are some things that you're hoping to accomplish maybe over the next year, maybe over the next couple of years, do you have some things that you're trying to, to get, um, to get done? Oh, uh, yeah. So that's a similar answer to what I told you the other, um, before I, people ask me like when 2021 came around, what are your goals? And I'm like, I have none. Like, really, I don't have any. Uh, I mean, I had a goal of starting a private equity funds, but what, where exactly what number I want to reach, I don't know. Because had I made goals um, three years ago, I would never describe, you know, I would never want the place that I am right now. I would have never imagined being where I am right now three years ago. So I don't like setting goals. I feel like I'm only getting started. I'm shooting for the moon. Right. You know, and I'm going to try my best to get there. So I don't have specific goals. I just want to connect, want to have fun in the process. I um, want to help people. And um, obviously I love, I'm, I love challenging myself and seeing where, you know, where, how far I can go. I love pushing my own limit. Um, so that, that for me is like, I like the challenge of it, but um, I don't have any specific, you know, goal. The more, the more money I make, the more people I can help. So I'm, you know, I can, if I can make more money and more people are happier, that's, there's the benefit in it. So the more, the more I do, the more I help. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's a great way uh, to, to put it. Um, and also, you know, talking about, um, you know, the, the value add type thing. Is, is there anything else maybe beyond the networking side of it and maybe the connection side of it that you do to help provide value to people that may be in your network or wanting to connect with you and all that kind of stuff? Is there anything that you provide to them? Anyone that needs advice, I'm happy to talk to, to them and, you know, offer them. I'm happy to teach them what I know. 
Um, obviously, I was writing articles and, um, you know, just uh, helping people learn from, from experts in the field, like learning from the best. Um, you can, you know, there's so many people that you can learn from and learn from their successes and their failures and, you know, what to do and what not to do. Um, yeah, I would love to connect and happy to connect with anyone that is getting out and starting out there. And um, yeah, happy to give back wherever I can. I joined podcasts to, you know, inspire people. If I can inspire one person to, to get to, you know, it's also like I switched careers at a very late age. Right. Um, you know, I was working as a speech language pathologist and then I switched careers. So I also want to give people the hope that there's never too late to do what you want. You know, so just knowing that and putting that out there, I think I can help people. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think that so far, so over the course of this episode, I think you've provided some great value. So that's good. That's good. Mission accomplished so far, but we're not done yet. I'm not letting you off the hook. So, all right. Um, all right. So the, um, one of the, one of the uh, things that you said in your most, uh, the answer before that last answer was that the more money you make, the more people that you could help. And I had mentioned early on uh, in the bio read that I did when I introduced you to the spotlighters, I said that you and your husband run a nonprofit assisting underprivileged individuals with their needs. Can you tell us more about that? Oh, we try to help wherever we can. Uh, there's a lot of people in our own community that in our you know little community where we live that are not making ends meet. So we you know do our best wherever we can to help them. Um, I, as a speech language pathologist, I was involved with a lot of children with special needs. So that organization touches my heart. Um, you know, I ran a marathon for them. I raised a lot of money for them. Um, so people, you know, those kind of organizations, I've dealt with a lot of such children. So that, like, you know, it's close to me. Um, really, like any organization that it's not a specific thing, but whatever we feel like we're out there trying to help as many people. Whether it's money, you don't always have to have money to help people. You could right. offer advice. And you could all you could be a support for people. There's so many ways to help others besides for providing actual money to them. Yeah. Has that has that always been something that, that you guys have been involved with? Has that always been very important to you to give back to the community? Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. My husband's like a huge giver. I learned so much from him. He's so generous. I'm like he lives like a minimalist, but he's like generous to the next person and it's beautiful. You know, he's always out there to help the next person as, you know, as much as we can, Yeah. Uh, whether it's driving a friend to the hospital or, or just listening to someone or offering financial assistance. You know, I, I, I learned a lot from him. Yeah, no, that's excellent. And, um, you know, I, I am also a believer in the idea that like the more good and the more, you know, positive vibe that you put out into the world, generally the more positive things kind of come back to you and that's not why you do it but it's a nice you know it's a yeah. nice little addition to that whole thing but um exactly. definitely yeah i think that's i think that's great and i think that's awesome that you guys are doing that so it's not a specific thing it's just like when you see somebody in need you're going to try to help which i think is awesome um all right so let's move the show into our closing segment and i know we talked about this before we before we started recording and i know that you know you weren't sure what you were going to talk about so hopefully you thought about it so the, uh, the closing segment is called under the spotlight so the spotlighters are listening have been listening to mike ham and esther rises lowenbein got it very good crushed it um uh -huh. talk for the last 40 45 minutes however long we've been going for um, so what would be one thing that you want them to walk away from this episode with? So you're under the spotlight. Well, so what we spoke about, you know, giving back, be good to mankind and God will be good to you. It's that's what it's, um, that's the sum of it all. Be good to the next person. We're, we're here on this earth to help each other. We have to do our best to uh, help humanity in any way we can and um, be good to be good, be giving, you know, without expecting anything in return. Just, we always want to be on the giving end versus the receiving end. So if you are, if you give God, you'll get back from, you know, God will be good to you and give you back. That's my philosophy. Awesome. That was great. I think you, you like psyched yourself out for that. And that was fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's hit them with the links. If people need more Esther and I can't imagine after this episode that they don't. So let's hit them with the links. Where can they go to get more of you? Uh, my website is Esther Rises Longline. 
sorry, my website is estherrises.com. I almost forgot that. My LinkedIn, <laughs> my LinkedIn um, name is Esther Rises Loan Money. You can find me over there. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm all over. I'm not on Twitter. It's not good for my health. Um, uh, find me on any of the platforms that I am on. And I'm um, happy to connect and happy to help the next person. Awesome. Yeah. And I will make sure that I put all of Esther's links that she just said uh, in the show notes. So if you do want to connect, I would gladly, you know, uh, I would, I would definitely make sure that you do that. Um, and then I will put my links in the show notes as well. The morning spotlight.com and the morning spotlight at gmail.com are the website and the email address respectively. Uh, Esther, thank you so much for coming on the show with us today. This was fantastic. My pleasure. And shout out to Jerome for connecting us. Yes, absolutely. And to the spotlighters, thank you for listening and we will catch you next time.